Hi, this is Ames Gross, and uh, thank you for attending our webcast today on Japanese business culture. I think for medical executives, the key thing to think about is when you're trying to register a product or license a drug or whatever, it's not just a matter of a business transaction in Japan. You have to look at the cultural and business issues about how Japanese people do their business. So we're going to slide, start on slide two here today, which is a quote from Lee Kuan Yew, the ex-Prime Minister uh, in Singapore. And the same really applies for Japan, even though he's talking about Singapore, Southeast Asia. So to be part of the Asian dynamism, Westerners do not need to become Asians in culture and values or in habits, but it is necessary for Westerners to understand Asians, or it's necessary for Westerners to understand Japanese, to feel at ease with Japanese and to make Japanese feel at ease with them. So again, if you don't, if you're not prepared business and culturally, it could make it more difficult to do your business transaction, register a product, or something like that. On the next slide, we have some information uh, about Asia. I think most people are aware of the fact that Asia is a large geographic uh, territory, and two-thirds of the world's population is in Asia. Now, you look at Japan, Japan has maybe 125, 130 million people right now, so a pretty significant population its own, its own. And in Japan, you have about uh, you know, 125, 130 million people in basically a geographic area the same size as California. So as you can imagine, in many places in Japan, it's pretty crowded. Uh, also in Japan, you have to keep in mind that the population is aging very quickly. Uh, there are many people in, in Japan who have silver hair, they have the gray hair, and they, people call them the silver generation, older people. And in fact, the population in Japan is expected to decline from around 125, 130 million people to about 100 million people uh, in the next 25 years. So uh, in Japan, most people are having less than one child, and uh, that's why there's a population uh, uh, population uh, uh, decline. But still, even in 25 years, at 100 million, uh, 100 million people with a you know very wealthy population, uh, it's a good uh, opportunity for many medical companies. On the next chart, you can see sort of the economics of the region. Uh, Japan is on the uh, fifth country down on the left, and um, you can see uh, uh, incomes on a per capita income basis, and you can see obviously the wealthiest countries right now in Asia would be Hong Kong, obviously it's part of China, but Hong Kong proper, and also Singapore. And then after that, on a per capita GDP basis, uh, you're looking at Japan uh, and some of the other Asian tar tigers like Taiwan or Korea. So Japan has had a pretty flat economy, as you can see on the right column, on the minus 0.7% growth over the last year. Um, and in Japan, because of the slow growth over the last couple decades, uh, you know, a lot of Japanese people refer to that as the uh, lost decades. But despite the, the rather flat economy over the last 20 years in Japan, uh, there is some growth, and people are quite wealthy and have plenty of money to spend on medical products. Asian demographics, uh, demographics, I mentioned about the population in Japan, the fifth country down, 127 million people. Of course, uh, in, in Asia, that would, be, uh, the, that would be the third largest country, so well, I mean, fourth, fourth largest if you look at uh, India, too. So you have China at 1.3 billion, India 1.2 billion, Indonesia at 250 million, and then Japan at 127 million. So far, the fourth largest population in the Asian marketplace. Now, when you're looking at Japan, you're looking at Asia, it's also very important to understand the Asian, Asian ethnic diversity. So people that have been to Japan and Korea, you can see that it's a very homogeneous and they have a very small minority population. In Japan, the, the smallest minority would be Koreans, uh, and those are Koreans that have uh, you know, been living in Japan for many years or recently moved over. But still, the Korean population in Japan is extremely small. And you can see some Westerners, Westerners now, some Indians in Japan, but for the most part, it's a very homogeneous society. And then if you look at some of the other Asian markets, you can see that they can be significantly more diverse. Specifically, Singapore, 77% Chinese, 14% Malay, 8% India. Um, or if you're looking at a you know, situation... Uh, like in Thailand, the majority are Thai people, but maybe 15% or so are Chinese. But Japan is a very homogeneous uh, situation with very few minorities. 
Also, on the religious side, Japan, you basically have 85% of the people are Shinto or Buddhist. And it's, a, it's important to get a sense of the religious diversity. So, again, Shinto and Buddhism dominating in Japan. You can see for some of the other Asian countries uh, the religious diversity in the region. Now, in the next slide, uh, we're talking about um, we're talking about positive Asian perceptions of America. So, let's say you're a Western executive and you're dealing with uh, with uh, Japanese people. So, on the positive side, the Japanese would say, "Okay, Americans, Westerner people, people from Europe or whatever, can be very systematic, uh, data driven, creative, uh, task oriented." Uh, individualistic, general, generous, confident, energetic, egalitarian, independent. So these are the things that, let's say, Japanese people understand about Western people on a positive side. So these are these are good things you want to emphasize when you're dealing with Japanese uh, customers or Japanese government, etc. On the next slide, we talk about negative perceptions about Asians, or it also applies directly to Japanese. So Japanese people often look at Westerners, uh, Americans, Europeans, whatever, Australians, as demanding, bullying, arrogant, aggressive. Couldn't be us, right, in the U.S., but uh, legalistic, argumentative. So these are the kind of um, <clears throat> qualities that uh, Asians and Japanese find about Americans or sometimes, you know, people in Europe or Canada or Australia, too. So it's really important when you're dealing with a Japanese partner, you're dealing with a Japanese company, uh, you're dealing with the PMDA, getting products registered in Japan, that you don't act like this because these are the things they look at as negative about people from the West. Now, on the bot next slide, you can see uh, Asian U.S. cultural tendencies, and this applies again to Japan. In Japan, the status is very important. Uh, focusing on the group is key. Relationship building throughout Asia and also in Japan is crucial as opposed to having lawsuits. Um, also, in Japan, as well as Asia in general, you want to avoid conflicts, uh, etc. And then you see the um, on the other side, in the U.S. or the Western countries, role is important, egalitarianism, individualism, task completion. So you can see on the Western side, individualistic, on the Asian side, or Japanese, focus on the group. And most decisions that are made at Japanese companies are, are coming from the bottom up, and they focus on group harmony and it's a group decision about how to go how to go forward. Next slide we have a map of Japan. I mentioned it's the same geographic size as the United States, uh, but 127 million people. Um, I mean I'm sorry, the, Japan is the same geographic size as California and uh, the state of California and has about 127 million people. As I mentioned on the next slide, the economy has been quite slow the last twenty years. Um, and uh, the government now is trying to uh, input to um, have an increase in the monetary supply. And as you know, if you've been following the Japanese yen over the last three months, three or four months, the Japanese yen has gone from one U.S. dollar to about 80 yen to today one dollar equals about 90 yen. So since Japan has a large export business, their products are now cheaper four months later, four months uh, later than they were four months earlier. Uh, when the yen relationship was maybe one U.S. dollar to 80 yen. So uh, the, the, the country in general has tried to reduce the, um, the currency level so they can increase their, uh, their trade and export. Um, now, you know, if you're looking at the Chinese, Japanese economy, you've you got to understand that, that in Japan there's these large conglomerates. Not, not all companies are, are in this Keiritsu system, but many large companies... Uh, have stockholders, and some of the stockholders would be from the um, the uh, suppliers of the suppliers to that Japanese company, to the distributors, and also to the banks. So, oftentimes for the uh, conglomerates, you'll see cross holding of shares uh, between the banks, suppliers, and also uh, people that are selling the products in Japan. It's called the K Ritsu system. Now, the reason this is important, the K Ritsu system, is that normally this is a family of companies. Uh, brother and sister companies. And for example, a long time ago, we had a, um, a medical executive who was going to Japan and he wanted to sell his product. And um, he thought it was fine. He was just going to go on his own. And he set up a, uh, a deal with a company called Mitsui. Mitsui is a trading company. And so when he came back and told me he was got an order for $500,000 of the product this year and $500,000 of the product next year, 
and told me the company that bought it was Mitsui, I was sort of curious because I knew Mitsui really wasn't in the medical business. But then you can actually look at the brother and sister companies on a chart, and I saw, I saw in the Mitsui Keiritsu that one of their sister companies was a medical device manufacturer. Needless to say, Mitsui had funded a million dollars so they could basically give the pro could have the products and the information on the products go to their sister company, and several years later, the sister company, Mitsui, was making the same products and no longer uh, made the orders from the U.S. company. Now, if you look at Japan today, um, lifetime employment uh, and seniority are still dominant, but uh, in some cases, uh, dwindling. Uh, the new generation of Japanese more individualistic, uh, sometimes less conventional, as I mentioned, the aging population. Um, and also, Japan is now much more involved with China. You can see they're squabbling over the islands, uh, whether it's Japanese or Chinese islands south of Japan. Um, but the Chinese are very dependent on the uh, Japanese economy, and the Japanese are very dependent on the Chinese economy these days. Now, before we get into some more cultural and business type issues, I'd just like to mention that uh, obviously what I'm going to talk about are generalizations, and obviously there's exceptions to the common Japanese norms. So what I'm going to say on the following 50 pages or so, 50 slides, uh, applies to most Japanese, but not always the case. And again, the Japanese person could have a, a different degree of westernization, depending on where they went to school, where they worked, etc. Um, the Japanese very much appreciate when foreigners understand their culture history, and foreigners show an effort and an interest in Japanese culture and history. And um, but keep in mind that Japanese also expect that many foreigners will not understand their culture fully, and so if you make a cultural mistake, uh, it's not the end of a relationship. Uh, it can be uh, okay. Again, the Japanese are see themselves as a group, um, and it's pr crucial for the group to preserve, preserve the ha harmony or wa within this group. So again, you know, you don't see um, Japanese people normally um, quarreling uh, outright one against the other. Uh, you know, decisions are made from a uh, bottom-up standpoint, and uh, you have to have group consensus to. Uh, to get people to, um, you know, agree and move on things. One of the uh, when a situation like this showing the group con 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 uh, the group situation is the group consciousness is we had a Japanese lady in my office, and uh, one day I asked her. She told me she went out on a date, so I said to her the next day, I said, "Was was was the guy cute?" And she says, "Well, I don't know yet because I have to ask my friends." So it'd be very rare for a U.S. or European person, for example, to have to ask their friends first if the guy was cute before responding to the question. But in Japanese, in this Japanese lady situation, she was dead serious. She could not make a determination on his attractiveness on her own. She wanted to ask her friends. And this is a good illustration of group consciousness in Japan, which is dominant throughout the society. Um, on the social truth here, um, again, they're not trying to... Um, uh, have embarrassing situations come up. As some of the other Asian countries, you want to um, save face, not, uh, you know, you want to have face and, 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 and not lose face uh, in public. So you can see the Hane and the Tatame, the private face versus the public face, the form versus substance. Again, we don't want to embarrass Japanese people in front of their peers. And, um, and again, we want to avoid making uncomfortable statements. So as everybody, I think, probably on the line knows today, the Japanese people in general have a hard time, hard time saying no. And what they'll do uh, instead of saying no is come up with some other issues like, I'm not sure that's going to work, we can consider this. So in a lot of cases, those kind of responses really mean no, and they won't say no directly. So on the next slide, <clears throat> we're talking about indirect communication. So saying things in, indirectly is a habit for Japanese people. And so, you know, if you say something to them and they say yes, uh, and they shake their head up and down, that doesn't mean necessarily yes, they agree with you. It's yes, we've heard you. So again, when Japanese maybe say yes and they nod their head up and down, it may just mean they heard you. It doesn't mean they're agreeing with what you're saying. So again, it's important to look at the implication of the words, the tone of the voice, the facial expressions. 
So on the next slide, we're talking about gratitude and um, obligation. So you have the jury, the obligation you owe some, someone just because of their position, their company, their age, their rank, uh, if they're a customer. And the on is the feeling of gratitude when someone does you a great favor. And the greatest on is to your parents. So you want to keep in mind the gratitude and obligation um, in Japan. Obviously, for the gratitude, um, more senior people in Japan normally get more respect. Um, and uh, uh, so these are important things to think about. Now, in the next slide, we're talking about hierarchy and seniority. As I mentioned just now, authority is strongly respected. Authority comes with age. And even a year or two of seniority makes a difference in friendships, families, workplaces, etc. So what I mean by that is, you know, you may be at one U.S. company talking to your European company, and the guy at the U.S. company is an uh, associate, associate level, and the person at the European company is a vice president of the European medical company. Now, that associate, the vice president, can send emails back and forth and discuss important issues despite the difference in their title and despite the, you know, despite the difference in their title and maybe there's a, an age difference, too, between the associate and the vice president in Europe. Now, for the most part, when Japanese companies interact with each other, the same title or same level of, of, of a person in one Japanese company will talk directly to the same level of the person in the second Japanese company. So, in other words, it would be very unusual for, like, an associate title at one Japanese company to talk to a vice president at another Japanese company. So, again, the age, the authority, uh, you know, very much respected. Uh, I remember when I started this business 25 years ago, I had a Japanese partner who, when I started, I was around 32 or 33 years old, and the partner was around 60, and we would have our dialogue uh, about what we wanted to do in the business, and the 60-year-old Japanese guy uh, got upset when I made suggestions about how we should uh, form the partnership and how we should work with them, because... The Japanese guy was 60, I was 33, and he didn't think I should have anything to say to him because I was so much younger. So in the West, that might be acceptable, but in Japan, it wasn't. And it was very hard for this older Japanese person to understand how a younger person uh, could be giving him some directions or uh, comments about future relationships. Um, also keep in mind that in Japan, the, the education is highly valued. What college you go to is closely connected to what kinds of jobs you will get. And there's a lot of clicks based on, you know, the alumni groups of certain colleges. So if you get into Tokyo University, which is the number one school in Japan, there's a huge Tokyo University alumni. And everybody recognizes the alumni. Everybody's very tight in the alumni. And, uh, you know, that'll help you with your job search and, and how well you do in your career. Other top schools in Japan might be like Keio University, um, Osaka University, um, again, very top-level schools. And the alumni clubs and the relationships with alumni after graduation is extremely close and extremely important. So that's why it's so difficult, not only in Japan, but some other Asian countries, that people are studying so much because they want to get into the top universities, because that university connection is more highly valued uh, in the Japanese or Asian situation than if you went to school in the Europe, Europe or the U.S. So in the U.S., if you went to a poor school but you're really great at your job, you're talking to somebody that went to a great school, it's okay at their job, you know, it, it's okay. Um, but in Japan, the Japanese will always look for where you went to school, and that will give them a sense of you know, where you are in the pecking order, too. Now, keep in mind that, you know, working for the U.S. government, maybe if you're in the White House or in the State Department, can be somewhat prestigious, but for the most part, people working at the universe, you know, let's say the uh, Treasury Department or people working at the Department of Commerce here, it's not such a prestigious job, and it may not attract the best and brightest Americans. But in Japan, the best and bright, in Japan and other Asian markets, the uh, employees of the government in whichever area it is, whether it's the MHLW, PMDA, Department of Defense, or whatever, the government officials in Japan are well-educated They've gone to the top schools, and they're often considered the elite in society. Government officials are highly respected in Japanese society. So if you're a medical company, and you're trying to get your products registered, and you're dealing with the PMDA, keep in mind that those PMDA officials um, are coming from top schools and are highly, are highly respected within the Japanese society. So it's important that you do, the, do that, too. Whereas sometimes, let's say, if you're dealing with the FDA, the U.S. FDA, 
uh, the people may have okay backgrounds, but not the superstar graduates of Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and um, they're not considered, you know, the elite uh, necessarily. And um, you want to treat them well, but, you know, it, it's different. The Japanese government people uh, are the cream of the crop. Now we're going to turn to um, some issues on the business front in Japan, and uh, hopefully we have some good insights here. So uh, characteristics of Japanese companies. Your Japanese companies are normally thinking long-term, uh, building the foundation brick by brick. Uh, they're not looking for short-term gains or short-term profits. Um, and oftentimes you'll find that Japanese companies, they want to get the right deal done with a Western partner, so they're willing to spend months or years making a decision. And that delay may miss an opportunity, but that's how uh, things are done in Japan. Uh, on the next slide, you can see um, that, uh, I think I mentioned this before, lifetime employment is dwindling, but uh, employment is still a, usually a long-term uh, situation in most companies. So lifetime employment may be dwindling in, you know, for Toyota, Sony, and in Tokyo, but for most com companies in Japan, uh, lifetime employment is still really the rule, the rule as, a, as opposed to the exception. Um, But Japanese, everybody I think on the line knows that they're looking for really high quality. They're seeking perfection, zero defects. And it's funny that, you know, we may send over a box of uh, drugs or medical devices or whatever, and if there's a small, um, you know, mosquito that's in the corner of the box, even though the individual products are, um, are wrapped uh, and sterilized on their own, uh, you know, the Japanese might send the, bo back spot, the box back to the U.S., Europe, or wherever, and then uh, claiming there was a, a dead mosquito in there, and you know it's unacceptable for for them to take that order. And then um, you can see on the next slide, uh, we're going to go into this a little more. They have an open office plan. If you're working in Japan, this is normally traditional. Um, and again, in Japan, the, the group concept. So oftentimes, the company or key officials of the company will go out and drink and uh, have dinner together. And um, Obviously, the Japanese are sort of formal, they're a little stiff, so when they have some drinks, uh, they're normally a little more relaxed and, uh, you know, you can talk to them. Uh, on the other hand, some of these people, Japanese executives, go out and get drunk every night and they come home staggering or they don't come home at all, and um, so you have a, a problem with that in some of the uh, drinking issues in Japan today, too. Now, here's a picture of a typical Japanese office, so you can see that the head person uh, is on the top there, and then there's a large open room where there are tables and computers on the tables, uh, but everything is out in the open. So in the West, we might have cubicles around these individual desks, but again, in Japan, everything is open on the table, and everybody can see everybody else. And you can see the conference rooms on the bottom, and also uh, uh, super the supervisors sitting at the front desk of each of the tables. So again, it's an open office environment as opposed to offices with doors and windows or uh, cubicles where people have a little more privacy. Now, it's important, I don't know how many people are dealing, you know, you're going to do some business in Japan with a Japanese drug company, Japanese device company, um, and you see the conference rooms. So normally Japanese people will put the foreigners furthest from the door in the conference room, and the Japanese people... Uh, you know, so the visitors are the furthest from the room in the conference room. Just like if a Japanese person comes to a conference room in the U.S., in the U.S. you want to put that Japanese person as far from the door as you can because they're the visitors. And the Westerners or, or Americans or Europeans would sit closer to the door with their backs to the door, whereas the visiting Japanese people would sit uh, furthest from the door. Now, if you don't do that, you're not aware of that kind of thing, you could sort of be insulting to the Japanese. So it's important that you uh, understand this kind of norm, too. Another similar situation would be if you're doing a cab. Uh, as you know, Japanese are interested in quality. They're also very conservative, uh, very, very conservative in general. So if you're hopping in a cab, let's say there's one Westerner and one Japanese person, it's always best to put the Japanese person behind the driver because that's a safer location in the cab than if the, uh, than the, the foreigner who's sitting where there's no uh, driver in front of them. So again, when you have two people, a Westerner and a Japanese hopping into a cab, let the Japanese person sit behind the driver 
in the cab. It's a more safe and secure position, and Japanese will appreciate that. Now, in the next slide here, not only in Japan, but throughout most of Asia, um, you know, we're look, uh, the, the business is done, you know, through harmony, um, uh, and mediation is always favored over lawsuit. In fact, you know, you know, sort of how it was here in the U.S. in the 40s and 50s, a handshake was your word. Still a lot of that's in Japan and the Asian markets. And um, uh, the, the people will, uh, will appreciate more harmony and less lawsuits in doing business. Sometimes we have uh, uh, companies doing business with Japanese companies, and they send us a distribution agreement or a licensing agreement. And the fact of the matter is there's about 75 or 100 pages in the agreement, and even a Westerner can't understand some of the legalese in the, um, in the uh, lawyer's contract. And so how can we expect people that speak a foreign language to understand what these legal terms mean? And most importantly is the, the, the relationships of trust and building that trust. And it takes a long time to build trust in relationships in Japan. You know, if we have a phone call today on this webcast, and then I speak to somebody after the webcast, to a certain extent we've developed a business relationship after one or two calls. But in Japan it may take five years or three years to build that relationship of trust. And during that three or five years, it's very important that you, um, you, you stay in touch with, with the Japanese person, you send holiday cards, you send a send a letter that's more personal, you need to do other things um, uh, to build the relationship of trust. Oftentimes, especially Americans, can be here today, gone tomorrow. Uh, if you can't do anything for them today, they don't even want to be in touch with you tomorrow. That's the opposite of the way you want to act in Japan, where you need to build long relationships of trust. And this is a good example here. Let's say you have a U.S. medical company, you have a regulatory department, they have an office in Japan, and Japan has a regulatory department. But the regulatory person in the U.S. and the regulatory person at the same company in Japan don't understand each other. They don't have a good relationship, so they squabble about which documents might be required for product registration. So I always say that half the reason there's regulatory problems uh, in Japan is a function of that the Western regulatory per person and the Japanese regulatory person don't have a really good relationship. And without that relationship, uh, the Japanese will be cautious and nervous about uh, their Western counterpart. Now, Japan is a, um, uh, a very competitive place. Um, and I'd say, in general, the competition in Japan is uh, significantly more, you know, there's more competition in Japan than you'd find in the U.S. And especially as the economy has gotten very slow in the last 20 years in Japan, the competition has even heated up further. Uh, in Japan, um, you know, typically an executive will rotate through different positions in the company. They might be in finance for three years, marketing for three years, management for three years. And in Japan, it normally takes a, a, a you know, you normally have to get over 40 years old to get some level of responsibility. So keep in mind then, if you're dealing or you hire a Japanese person that's under 40, the, in the U.S., a person under 40, let's say 35, may have already had good management experience, had lots of responsibility to the company. But normally, Japanese, a Japanese company, if they're under 40 years old, the level of responsibility they've had under 40 is probably not very significant. So sometimes companies hire Japanese people for their Japanese operations. They hire somebody under 40. The person worked at, you know, uh, the person worked at uh, a Japanese uh, device company, let's say like Terumo, and they're expecting there'll be a big asset to the foreign company's operation in Japan. But the fact of the matter is the 35-year-old person they poached from Terumo is not, uh, doesn't have much responsibility to Terumo. And when they're thrown into a responsible situation at the Western company, uh, it could quite be quite difficult. Um, so let's see the next slide. Um, getting to making a contact. Obviously, if you don't know the company you're dealing with, it's always best to use some kind of middleman to initiate the first meeting. Uh, doing cold calls in Japan is difficult because of the nation of relationships and trust. People don't, don't, don't like to, mate, to, to meet, really, if it's just a cold meeting. And, um, again, the middleman can help play a key, risk, key uh, intermediary role uh, after uh, the two parties have gotten together. And uh, so in the next slide, we have the run-up to the meeting. And basically, um, 
So you can exchange some information before the meeting, but normally to do business with Japanese people, you need to meet face-to-face. And if you don't meet face-to-face and you just try to do emails or phone calls or whatever, it's normally not going to help solidify the uh, situation. Um, Okay. Who to send? Well, it's important to send senior members of the company if it's a senior-level meeting. Um, and uh, it's good to find uh, Western people that are patient, sociable, humble. You know, we don't want to go over as arrogant Americans and deal with humble Japanese and expect that it's going to be a good situation. Now, in the next slide, we're talking about preparation. Japanese like to have lots of written materials to review in advance, and you can see some of the things, detailed company information, samples, some information translated to Japanese. And it's also important that the Western side do copious research on the Japanese company you're dealing with so you can understand their situation and intelligently comment on it. Um, So you can see the next bullet point, become familiar with the background of the Japanese managers, the company. And then once you've done this kind of background information, the Westerner will be prepared to deal with the Japanese. Now, I can't tell you how many Western companies call me up and they say, I'm going to Japan in two weeks. Uh, Can you set up some meetings with me for these companies? And uh, so obviously, you know, Japanese like to have the meeting date well in advance. They like to see the agenda well in advance. And they like to know, have information about what's going to happen in the meeting well in advance. So when companies call me up and they say they'd like us to help them meet, you know, these three drug companies in Japan, and we're going in 10 days, I say it's pretty impossible to set that up. Because Japanese need more time to prepare for the meeting and then to get it on their schedule. And they also need information to help them understand what the meeting's all about. Now, what about if Japanese potential partners, licensees, or licensors, or companies come to visit you? Well, it's, impa- it's important to act like Japanese aren't going to act when you visit them. So in other words, if you go to a Japanese company, normally what will happen, the Japanese will have a welcome sign at the front desk. They'll say, welcome Mr. Smith from XYZ Medical Company in the United States. So, um, also, if you go to a conference room in Japan, you'll see that they have a lot of uh, plaques about, you know, their quality or their company, uh, uh, their company uh, standards or whatever. And so, it's important when Japanese come to visit you, visit you, do what they're accustomed to, make them feel comfortable. Have a welcome sign at your front desk, dear Mr. Fuji. Uh, you know, Mr. Fuji from XYZ Company Japan. Thank you for coming to visit our office on January 9th, 2013. And also, when you bring the Japanese person into the conference room, don't put them near the door. Put them the furthest at the table, at the, the conference room table, furthest from the door. And it's good to have these kind of conspicuous plaques, you know, ISO plaques or whatever, so they can see that you're very in tune to quality and other uh, key corporate, you know, Western corporate uh, cultural goals, too. Now, when you're meeting people in Japan, normally the most senior person will meet, and then you go down the hier- hierarchical ladder. Um, so the senior people meet the senior people in Japan meet the senior people in the West and so on and so forth. And um, so you want to make sure that you know the people that are attending, what their titles are, uh, so you can know where they're you know where they stand when you have have the meeting. Uh, most Japanese people are bowing uh, to each other. Uh, that's the common etiquette. Um, but you know Japanese and Westerners are willing to to, to have a handshake and. Um, so Japanese are very comfortable giving Westerners a handshake. Um, but in general, I'd say that Westerners don't need to bow uh, to Japanese people. And, um, and you can see some details about bowing. But for the most part, Westerners can just shake the Japanese people's hands. Now, the thing is, when you're shaking a Japanese person's hands, what you'll find is Westerners have been taught to have a really tight grip, to squeeze that Japanese hand, to squeeze that person in your meeting's hand, the Japanese hands, strongly, and make them know that you're real uh, serious and that you have power or whatever you do with a strong grip that's very common in the, in the Western world. But Japanese will normally give you a loose hand, and they don't like a small, a really strong grip. So just give them a looser uh, shake than you would normally do in the West, and uh, that should suffice. Now, the next slide, obviously, you have to go to the meetings in Japan, all meetings with multiple business, you know, with, with many business cards, because that's a ritual. You're receiving the cards with two hands. You're handing the the cards uh, to the receiver so that they can see the print. It's facing them. 
And um, so when the Japanese give you their card, you can read their name, you can read their title, etc., and they're going to do the same when they receive your card. Uh, and then the thing is about the cards is you want to put the cards on your on the table in the conference room uh, so you can remember the people's names and in the appropriate position. So, you know, the guy that's sitting on the left, you put his card to the left, and the guy on the right, you put it on the right, so you can have a good sense of the names, and then you can also see the titles. Now, when you receive the business cards, you want to stare at the cards for a couple of minutes. You don't want to slip it into your pocket or your wallet. You want to look at the card. You want to think about the person's name. You want to think about their title. And take a serious look at that because that's what the Japanese are doing when they receive your business cards, and that will make them feel the most comfortable. So you're handing out the cards facing the Japanese person with both hands um, so they can read it. And if they give you their card at the same time, you can, let's say, let go of the card with your left hand to accept theirs and receive it only with one hand. Um, but again, uh, you want to take time to carefully read the card. And you want to treat the card with respect. I wouldn't put notes on the back of business cards. I wouldn't scribble on the front. Um, you know, you want to put them on the table, put them away when it's appropriate after the meeting, not during the meeting. Now, when you're doing with Japanese people, you know, you can call them Mr. or Mrs., Doctor, whatever, or you can refer to, uh, like, somebody's last name, like my last name is Gross, so you could say Gross-san. Um, that's appropriate, too. But I don't try to to use uh, Japanese or other Asians first names if I don't know them really, really well because, you know, actually in the local culture, they don't, you know, unless they know somebody really well, they're not going to use their first name. They're going to always use their last name and their company name. That's why, actually, if you receive a call on the phone from a Japanese person, they're going to state their name and then their company name uh, as an introduction to their call. Not only their, their, their Japanese name, but also then their company name. More formal and... Um, and I, you know, sometimes they'll say, okay, well, you can call me Frank Watanabe, but I would still call the guy Mr. Watanabe. I wouldn't call him Frank. And that's because you don't know really the person. Now, five, ten years later, if you, if you know the person really well, you've been dealing with them day in and day out, you know, it's okay to call him Frank. But again, I would use Mr. and Ms. Son as uh, ways to communicate unless you know the person very well. It's a lot more respectful to address the people in this manner. Um. So personal inquiries, sometimes Japanese, um, you know, obviously they want to know what your relative status is in the company. Um, and as I mentioned before, only people at the same rank or level will talk to each other. Um, you know, the thing about I was talking about the conference rooms and where the guest sits and where, the, where you want to put the Japanese uh, is illustrated on the next slide. So you can see where the um, door is on the bottom left left there. And so the door is going into a conference room, which is going to a rectangular table. And so again, the guests, let's say it's in the U.S. or Europe, the guests sit furthest from the door, as you can see on the far side of the table. And then the different ranks will normally sit across from each other. So three to three, one to one, two to two. Normally it'll be three, two, one, but this illustration sometimes could be a little differently. But normally the people at the same levels sit across from each other at the table, and the the guests will normally be furthest from the door. Now, gifts. Um, uh, gift giving is, uh, you know, common in Asia and also in Japan. Um, normally, what the best thing to do is if you're having an introductory meeting is bring a small gift, maybe with your company logo on it, uh, you know, maybe a pen or a baseball hat or something like that. Uh, personal, grif personal gifts um, normally only done when there's a pre-existing relationship. Um, and then keep in mind, when you're receiving anything in Japan, whether it's business papers or a gift, you want to receive it just like your business cards with two hands. And you want to look at it very closely. You want to appreciate the fact that it's been wrapped very carefully and, um, you know, put it down and, and, and take it home with you. Sometimes people will ask, some Japanese will say, well, you can open it up in front of us, so that's okay too. But keep in mind, when you're receiving documents in Japan, evidently you want to, always you want to receive those with two hands. Uh, so you can uh, show more concern of the documents as opposed to one hand or throwing it on the table. Now, the next slide, oftentimes we're dealing with Western people who hire Japanese interpreters. Uh, and, that, you know, most Japanese, their English is, their spoken English is pretty poor, but their uh, reading English and comprehension of English of written documents is pretty decent. Um, but again, you know, uh, tra translating Japanese to English and English to Japanese is not like tra translating English to Spanish. In Spanish, 
Spanish to English. Obviously, depending on the level uh, uh, and the age of the person, certain different words are used in Japanese. And again, English to Japanese is, and Japanese to English is a lot more complicated than translating English to Spanish or Spanish to English. So we always recommend that if you're having an audit, for example, uh, you know, make sure that the, the interpreter or the translator during the, during the audit um, uh, speaks fluent Japanese and English and especially has some medical background, either in drugs or devices, so that they know some of the medical tech terminology. Um, and as you can see, it's normal for the interpreted Japanese version to sound longer than the English version. Um, and again, even if you're, the translator is telling you what the Japanese person is saying, you don't want to focus on the translator or the interpreter. You want to focus on the Japanese person that said it. So it's really easy to turn your head from the Japanese person that was talking to you to the interpreter, but it's a lot more polite if you just continue to look at the Japanese person and listen to what the interpreter has to say and not focus your eyesight on uh, the interpreter. Japanese are very conservative. Uh, conservative dress is really what you want to go for. Men are normally wearing dark jackets, dark suits, uh, white shirts, not pink shirts, blue shirts, and fairly conservative ties. Um, and you can see there, don't take your jackets off until the Japanese do. And again, for women, too, to really wear more conservative um, uh, outfits, uh, more business-type attire, and be less casual. Um, okay, so the next slide, we're talking about conducting business in Japan. And so on the left side, you have what the American or the Westerners might do, uh, get right down to business, whereas the Japanese will normally spend the first meeting or even the first several meetings getting to know you, getting to understand your company, getting to understand your background, and getting to understand your point of view. So Westerners to get right down to business are going to feel frustrated because the Japanese will move a lot slower, and they're going to really want to get to know you more before they uh, proceed to the next step. Um, list key items on the Western side, list key items and negotiate them one by one. And then again, the Japanese work everything out as a whole, starting vaguely and gradually getting more detailed. Um, and then on the bottom, like the evaluation cr the criteria. So the Western side might say profit. And then on the Japanese side, um, they may be looking for market share, prestige, uh, ability to keep their employees employed, um, and more of a long-term outlook on profits and sales as opposed to a quick fix, which you often find in the West. So to the, more, to, the, to the extent you can understand this kind of mentality with the Japanese, the better you're going to do at the table. And, um, you know, if you're going to be an ugly American and you're dealing with Japanese people, it's going to make it that much difficult to, more difficult to, do the, to build the relationship, to do a project, to do a deal, to register a product, uh, et cetera, in the medical world. So here we have some um, uh, negotiating tactics uh, that, you know, I want to keep people in mind with, not, not just Americans. We have some Europeans on the phone today, too. Europeans, I think, in general, may be a little more polite than, than Americans, but the Americans, you know, might be, you know, the hard sell. So instead of um, saying we have the top product on the market, la di da la da, you know, you might say, as you can see, our product has sales of 20 million, whereas the closest competitor has sales of 10 million. So you're making the point that you're the, the top seller in the, the market, but you're not saying, you know, you have the most sales in the market, and obviously, you know, you have to be an idiot not to understand that you have a dominant position. But, you know, saying we have the top product, you know, that could turn it off, come across arrogant, and may not be the best way to, to talk to the Japanese. Um, and then again, you can see on the good on, on uh, the first uh, bullet point, our product is the only one in the market with features A, B, and C. In other ways, to toot your, to your horn on the product, but not come across as arrogant, you know, that kind of thing. So the next bullet point, reminder of competition. So I've seen Western companies, there are plenty of other com com companies in Japan that are willing to work with us on better terms. So the hard sell, the hard negotiations on the Western side. And you can see what would be more appropriate in Japan. We think a long-term relationship between our two companies would have great benefits for us both but we need to start out on a mutually acceptable basis. Now, if you're even in the U.S., it's so much more polite if somebody says we want to have a long-term relationship uh, on a mutually acceptable basis as opposed to one side saying we got the best product in town. If you don't like it, there's other companies will take it on. That's the worst way to present your uh, situation in Japan. And you can see on the last bullet point, bad, we expect better from you. 
Um, good. We have, accom- we have accommodated your requests on previous issues, A, B, and C. Expect some flexibility on your part as well. So these are ways to look at difficult situations and change the words so they're more delicate, more sensitive. You get the same point across, but you don't do it in this uh, direct Western way or American way, which could oftentimes turn off the Japanese. Um, so you can see the next slide is talking about scheduling. Again, you know, you want to do this uh, well in advance. I think we can skip this slide. Um, so keep in mind the Japanese, you know, they're, you know, in, there were very few salespeople in Japan for many, many years because if you bought a Sony radio, the guarantee of that Sony radio, Sony radio lasting five or seven years was automatic. So you didn't have to have a salesman saying the features. Everybody knew that Sony produced high quality product. There was a warranty or guarantee on the product for X years, and that's the way it was. So the Japanese, too, they're thinking if they buy your product or they deal deal with you, after-sales service is crucial, just like the quality of your product. And, um, again, Japanese may be looking for more frequent deliveries as opposed to one big shipment. Um, so you want to keep your uh, customization sometimes for Japanese uh, patients is important. So keep things to keep in mind. Now, if you come into an argument and if something is embarrassing, um, you know, you want to take a break as opposed to trying to escalate the tension, escalate the uh, problems in the relationship. So you get some tea, coffee, uh, maybe a middle person can help you uh, ease the pain on both sides, give each side the point of view, and you want to diffuse difficult situations and you don't want to have uh, lawsuits, clashes, etc. It's just going to turn the Japanese people off. Now, on the next slide, we're talking about body language. You know, actually, I, you know, a lot of times in the U.S., people will use their finger and they'll point, like charts. But, um, you know, in Japan, it's always better to uh, have your hand out flat. So you're not using one, one finger to print, just have your hand out flat to show the point on the chart on the wall. Um, so don't sneeze or blow your nose in front of others. Um, so obviously, the Japanese, besides being very quality or very conservative, are scared of germs. So you want to be more aware of that. That's why they wear the white gloves on the subways, and they wear, if they have a cold, they wear the face masks over their faces because they don't want anybody else to get exposure to the cold. So the thing is, is that you want to do the same thing. I mean, you know, if you have a, uh, a hanky and you're blowing your nose all the time, you don't want to put it on the table. They're going to look down at that. Um, and again, you know, mostly it's formal uh, Japanese people, so a handshake is okay, but uh, other touching of the body may make Japanese feel uncomfortable. And, again, when you're in Asia and, you know, in Japan, uh, you don't want to make excessive eye contact. In the U.S. or Western world, oftentimes making direct eye contact is a way to make sure that the listener or the other person knows that you're right on target with them, they're hearing what you're saying. But too much, too much uh, eye contact in Japan is not appropriate because the Japanese don't do that. So occasionally looking at the person's face occurs occasionally looking down at the floor or whatever as you're talking. You don't want to stare at the person's, the Japanese person's face uh, during a 10-minute conversation. It's going to be awkward for them because they don't do that in their own uh, culture. Um, so again, body language, language, body language, uh, important. Um, sucking air through their teeth, rubbing or scratching the head or the back of the neck, that could show some frustration on the Japanese side. And keep in mind that if Japanese are in a meeting with you and they close their eyes for a few minutes, that's common in Japan. That's not considered rude. So in the West, if you close your eyes, eyes where there's a conference room, people might say, hey, you're closing your eyes. It's not appropriate for a conference room. But for the Japanese, if there's a difficult situation or there's an impasse or some of the uh, exchange of the words isn't exactly right, they may close their eyes and try to calm down and think about what's being said. And in Japanese terms, clo- Japanese terms, closing your eyes is not considered rude. So again, because of the language difficulties, it's very important that you don't talk like I'm talking on this web- webcast very quickly. You speak clearly and slowly, and you want to avoid slang and idioms. So, Mr. Fuji, we sent our uh, agreement to you three days ago. Did you have a chance to see it? Not, Mr. Fuji, did you see the agreement I sent you three days ago? You know, 
Because in the language issue, most people can understand English, or some can understand English, but you want to make it slow and clear. Again, Westerners want to avoid bragging. Um, and when praising Japanese, again, you want to praise the group, not the individual. And also, you know, Westerners that tell jokes, it's normally not going to be understood by Japanese, so no reason to do the jokes because it may turn them off. So on the next slide, we're talking about, uh, again, conversation. Um, so bad, will you know your decision by the end of this month? And that's a typical thing you might say in the West. Will we know your decision by the end of this month? And nobody would say it's bad. But a better way to say it in Japan where it's more harmonious is going to be what kind of time frame should we expect for hearing your decision? That's a very different outlook on how you're talking to Japanese people. If you talk to Japanese people like they like to talk amongst themselves, you're going to do a lot better. And then, again, in meetings, always take lots of notes. And the Japanese prefer that. You know, they, they like it when the foreigners are taking notes because they think the foreigners are really listening and taking the meeting more sen you know, more, more seriously, uh, et cetera. Uh, so we talked about the Japanese not really saying no. They might say that's difficult. We're not certain about this. Uh, we'll need to study these issues further. That is very interesting. That is very interesting. And again, yes, it's an acknowledgement that they've heard you, but not that they agree with what you've said. Uh, ways to express disagreement. So the bad way here, we're interested in X, not Y. But the better way to say that might be what you have said on Y is certainly true, but X is also important from our point of view. Again, the good ways and bad ways to communicate with Japanese people. Bad ways, some shipments are coming in damaged. We understand that it is difficult to pack things so that there's no damage. We understand we're willing to work with you. So again, it's really the tone. It's really very different than Westerners deal with each other, and it's important for you to build that relationship of trust, a longstanding relationship, by making the Japanese feel comfortable in your dialogue, in your appearance, your clothing, how you receive the business card, uh, et cetera. Now, I already mentioned that dealing with the government, the government people at the MHLW, Ministry of Health, Wealth, Labor, and Welfare, the PMDA, um, are the top people you know, in the society. Uh, they want high-quality products. And, you know, the government officials are very concerned. The Japanese in general are very conservative. The, J the Japanese government officials are very conservative. And they're really, ha they're, really ha they're really worried that some foreign products, drugs, devices, whatever, could cause harm to the Japanese populace, uh, population, in which case they may be personally responsible, not just members of uh, the government entity. Now, when you're dealing with the Japanese, too, whether it's a presentation, registering products, etc., you always want to make sure the documents are consistent. And, you know, tiny inconsistencies when you submit a dossier to the Japanese government uh, will put a, officials on alert. Um, and make sure whatever you say is backed up. And, um, and even if the Japanese, your own Japanese office or your distributor in Japan uh, is not involved with some discussions, make sure they know what's going on so everybody's still in the loop. Now, a good example is, you know, if you're registering, let's say, a device in Japan, you might have to have a QMS on-site order, a Japanese uh, quality uh, system audit at your facility, let's say, in Europe and the U.S. Now, again, when the Japanese orders come, it's good to have a welcome sign in the front. It's good that everybody at the different stations will be expecting a Japanese person hand the card to the Japanese auditor with two hands and make sure that they have backup to explain what's going on. Keep in mind, too, when Japanese orders come to Western factories, they don't want to just look at the quality systems on your computer. They like hard copies. In certain situations, you might want to change those hard copies in English into hard copies in Japan to make them understand that you're culturally sensitive and make it easier for them to understand how your quality system operates. Socializing, eating, uh, so, you know, you may not know what they like to eat. If you're in Japan and you don't like sushi, you can always ask them to go to more of a place where there's cooked food, too. Um, and as you know, slurping noodles in Japan is normal. It's not considered rude, whereas if you're slurping noodles in the West, oftentimes it's considered impolite. And uh, as, you, as we mentioned, uh, Japanese will oftentimes drink in the evenings. Uh, as it says here, it's normal for Japanese to loosen up considerably when drinking. Um, their actions may even seem childless. Um, but this is how you can get some additional information from Japanese when they're not so tight 
they loosen their tie and uh, they're not in the uh, office following company protocol. Um, so if you're out at dinner, it's probably better not to talk about hard business, uh, you know, because uh, it's a more social experience. And the socialization can help you build the relationship of trust, too. Um, and then with regard to the tab, normally if you go out to get some dinner in Japan, it's three times what it costs in the U.S. So don't be hesitant when they, the Japanese come to visit you to pick up the tab uh, when a, your Japanese partner comes over, whatever. It's less expensive here, and it's appropriate for the host to pay the bill. Now, sometimes if you're going to Japan many times and you're meeting with the same Japanese company, you may offer, say, listen, you've taken me out the last four times. I'd like to take you out tonight. So that's appropriate, too. That, that's a sign of good faith that you realize the Japanese have taken you out to dinner five times in a row and you'd like to uh, reciprocate. Um, as you mentioned before, the company, Japanese companies normally take a long time to make up their minds. They want to make absolutely sure they're making the correct decision and that everybody at the company is on board with the decision they're making. And uh, on the next slide, you can see what they call the Ringi system. And so this is what I mentioned. The, the people in the bottom of the Japanese drug company, whatever, you know, they'll discuss the details of the issues, and then the, the, the proposal informally discussed with various employers and managers. And then if it has enough uh, uh, support at a lower level, the proposal is uh, put in written, writing and circulated formally up to higher levels. And again, this takes more time, so you don't want to be acting like a pushy Westerner saying, you know, you had this for three weeks, why can't you make a decision? That is going to be interpreted rude in Japan. It's up to the Westerner to understand that they're making a bottom-up decision where everybody has to come on board, and it takes a longer period of time to do that. So we have to understand where they are coming from when they say it's not going to be done in three days, it's going to take them three weeks. And Nemawashi here, this is basically, um, even where the Ringi system is not used, uh, it still reflects the Japanese way of decision making. The informal consultation before submitting a proposal or other actions. Um, so again, another you know sort of informal uh, consultation amongst the Japanese parties uh, so that there's a group consensus. It's not sort of a dictatorial decision. Uh, so when you had some success in Japan, it's often frequent to have a large banquet, to toast each other, speeches may be made. And uh, because Japanese are more formal, these kind of formal these kind of ceremonies are really more are very important in Japan. But it's important that when you're going, you wear considerable sort of outfits, guys wear white shirts, dark ties. You don't want a white shirt and a pink tie. It's still going to be offensive to Japanese. Now, building relationships takes time, and it takes a lot of work, and it takes a lot of effort. Now, most Westerners don't put the time and energy into build the relationship, so that's why they have problems when they're dealing with their Jap Japanese counterparts, their Japanese distributor, their Japanese partner, etc. So once you've built those, started to build the relationship, you need to keep in touch, and you need to do things like send holiday cards, send letters, um, you know, have meetings, uh, seasonal gifts. You don't want to just contact people in Asia or Japanese people when you need them which is par for the course in the West. You want to stay in touch with people in Asia and Japan as to build the relationship of trust, not because you need them tomorrow to do something for you. So, for example, you know, I'm sending out holiday cards with, uh, you know, lots of people, let's say, in the Philippines. Now, I haven't been to the Philippines in five years, but the people that I send, let's say the 10 companies I send the, the, the holiday cards in the Philippines, they think, who is this crazy American that keeps sending us holiday cards over the last five years and he hasn't asked us for any, any favors or any business transactions. So, but I know if I go to Manila, like, you know, in a month or so, and I tell people I'm coming, even though I haven't seen these people for five, six years, they come to meet me because they know that I've acted not like a typical Westerner. I've been in touch with them for five years, either through holiday cards or other kind of communication, and they want to see you. So you want to build the relationship socially and professionally, and it takes a lot of work. But as, as you're able to build friendships, it's going to help cement the uh, relationship. And these are crucial things you want to keep in mind uh, as you're proceeding on developing your relationship in Japan. Now, if the relationship turns sour, um, it's very important that you apologize and explain to the Japanese why you made a mistake or where the company made a mistake or you use somebody in the middle to explain why there was a mistake. Um, and if you, you know, so you want to just be open and 
forward with the Japanese what's going on. Um, when the bottom never breached a contract with the Japanese company, because word will get around in the Japanese, Japanese industry quickly, especially in the medical area. Uh, you know, a lot of the medical people go to different types of associations and whatnot. And if one company in Japan says they work with one foreign medical company and they say the foreign medical company wasn't good, then it's not going to be easy to find that, that Western company, find another partner in Japan because they've painted the reputation in some medical circles in Japan. Now, on the next slide, women in Japan, um, you know, historically women have been in clerical jobs. Uh, when you walk in the streets in Japan, oftentimes you'll see the wives walking four feet behind, you know, four feet behind the husbands. Um, but keep in mind that the Japanese are open to Western women visiting Japan uh, for business purposes. So, you know, Western business people can do that. You also see more women now getting ahead in Japanese companies, but still it's a very, very small minority, mostly uh, male-dominated in Japan. But male-dominated Japanese people, they're open to Western business, with business women as long as you come across professionally, have your I's and T's dotted, and, you know, you're, you're prepared for uh, the meetings. So we talked about in the first uh, quote we had was from Lee Kuan Yew, is that it's important for foreigners to understand Asians, Asian cultures, and Asian values. So hopefully this presentation has given you some insight in how to deal with Japanese, whether you're going into a cab, you're going to a conference room, having them sit further from the door, good and bad ways to certain, say certain things, the fact that they have a longer decision-making process, group decision. So it's really good to understand that's very, there's a very strong culture in Japan for doing business and being successful in Japan. But on the last quote here on the last side, what we're saying is if rule number one in international negotiations or in dealing is to know the culture of the other side, which is what the first quote we had on the presentation, rule number two is to, buy, to avoid over-reliance on that knowledge. So once you understand the Japanese history, the culture, the people, you've built the relationships, you know, people are people, good is good, bad is bad, and, you know, you want to stay with making smart business decisions in a, you know, in a professional manner. So that's going to uh, conclude my formal comments for the webcast today. We're going to send out some evaluation of forms. We'd appreciate your uh, feedback that, on those uh, evaluation forms. And we're going to also now uh, go to a Q&A period. And if you have a question, um, please send your question in uh, through the chat function on the website, and, um, and uh, we can proceed there. Now, I've already received six or seven questions, so let's start with those. Uh, the first question says, it's the second time we've met a Japanese company. Um, we gave them small gifts the first time. Do we need to give another gift during the second meeting? So the, um, the uh, webcast attendee says, it's the second time we meet with a Japanese company. We gave them small gifts. The first time we, we met with them, do we need to give them additional gifts during the second meeting? So I'd say the answer to that is probably no. Um, you know, it's good to give some Japanese appropriate gifts during the first meeting, maybe at the end of the first meeting. But subsequent meetings, uh, giving gifts is really not appropriate. But what is appropriate between the first and the second meeting is that you understand Japanese business and culture, and you do things according to what they're used to. So you gave some gifts the first meeting. You have some emails exchanged before the second meeting. Make sure those emails are uh, appropriate for Japanese people. Now, normally Japanese people, they're going to start, you know, dear Mr. Smith, how is the weather in Chicago? We understand you had a snowstorm. I hope the snow is not preventing you from going to work. Then they say, with regard to this issue, blah, 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 as opposed to what you see a lot of Westerners, dear Mr. Fuji, attach your three documents. Please sign them. Send them back to me ASAP. Thanks, Wendy. So... Again, Japanese people on the emails, they're going to look for small talk in the beginning. That's what they oftentimes will do with you, and that's what you should do with them. So, again, the Westerners might say, attach three documents, sign them, send them back, see you later. Again, uh, Mr. Fuji, I understand the weather in Hokkaido, north of Tokyo. It's been very cold. Has there been much snow? Blah, blah, blah. Sort of this short introductory paragraph to do what the Japanese are used to, small talk. They like to have small talk to break the ice. Then, very politely, go into the issue. We have three documents. Uh, they're attached. Uh, could you please sign them? If you have any questions, please let me know. Please don't feel you have to sign them without asking me questions. I'm more than happy to answer your questions. So, again, not saying sign the documents in the back. 
make sure that the receiver understands what's going to be in the documents, and make your emails, your greetings with Japanese, your relationship with Japanese, similar to what, the, what they do to themselves, because Japanese people in general are not so direct to the point uh, within the first minute of the conversation or the first email they send. Okay, so uh, the next question is, uh, I've heard, well, I heard you say today about the Japanese Karitsu, karitsu system um, with the multiple shareholders. Where can we learn more about that? So, as I mentioned, a lot of big companies in Japan will be members of this Karitsu system. They have sister and brother companies. And there's actually a book that you can get which has, uh, you know, Mitsui, let's say, in the center with the little arm, you know, uh, uh, you know, sort of a, a straight line dotted to different subsidiaries and different affiliates. Uh, Etc. So there is a book where you can look at different Keiritsu systems so that you don't end up dealing with a company like Mitsui and Company who you think is buying your stuff, but really they're just buying it to give samples and get regulatory documents on your products to their sister company who then is going to come out with a similar product. So know who you're dealing with when you're dealing with Japanese companies. Okay, the next question. Um, we went to a meeting, but we weren't as prepared as you mentioned the webcast. We weren't as prepared as, as we should be. Uh, we want to change the Japanese company's uh, notion of our company, uh, but they probably didn't get a great, uh, a great feeling during the first meeting. What should we do? So we went to a meeting, the first meeting, not as prepared as we want to be. We went to the second meeting. We want to make them understand that we're sort of embarrassed about the first meeting, and what should we do to make the Japanese understand that the company culture is better than what we showed at the first, first meeting? So the, the issue is, is the first meeting now, if you've come to this webcast, is you want to make the first meeting correct. You don't want to show any dirty laundry in the first meeting, which will create doubts in the Japanese partners, you know, the Japanese partner of the company about what your company is all about. But if you do screw up in the first meeting, it's important when you have the second meet right in the beginning to say, we want to apologize. We were not as prepared as we should have been for the first meeting. That's our problem. We understand the Japanese like to have very strong preparation before the first meeting. We apologize. We did not do this. So you can apologize for a mistake. We would like to start again. Can we introduce our company to you again? Can we go over some other details which we might have missed in the first meeting? That's the kind of acceptance of you made a mistake, you want to change things around, and you're asking the Japanese in a very humble, humble way to accept the fact that you would like to uh, you know, recreate your your uh, your your uh, recreate your image of the company in a more positive manner. Okay, the next question says, um, what other cultural things should we be aware of? What other cultural things should we be aware of? Well, I think I talked about some of them um, um, uh, today already. Um, you know, if you're going into the cab, let the Japanese person sit behind the driver. It's a more safe position in the car. Putting the Japanese at the back of the conference room furthest from the door if they're visiting you in the West. Uh, again, having a greeting sign, you know, welcoming the visitors. So, you know, these are the main cultural things. Uh, you know, there's other things you could do, but I think if the Western company can, show mo can understand and experience and show most of these kind of Western cultural things, it will help you to build the relationship of trust with your Japanese colleagues. Okay, next question. Uh, we are in the regulatory area. What's the best way to deal with our Japanese counterparts uh, in the regulatory area in Japan? So as I mentioned during the presentation, the Japanese regulatory people in your own Japanese office may not trust the regulatory people at the headquarters office because the Japanese people understand that Western regulatory people may not have any personal liability for having problems in the documents, whereas Japanese regulatory people at your, your subsidiary in Japan oftentimes do have personal liability if there's a big mistake uh, with your product in the Japanese medical market. So you need to understand where they're coming from. You need to meet with these people face-to-face. -face. You need to send the emails appropriately. Meeting with them once or twice is not going to work. You need to meet with them maybe quarterly, sometimes in the U.S., Europe, sometimes in Japan. You want to have part of that meeting be social, not just uh, business, and you want to build that relation of trust. So when you say to the Jap your Japanese regulatory counterpart in Japan, we don't have this document, and to do this document, it's going to cost $300,000 for a testing lab. Are you sure it's important? 
instead of the Japanese guy, regulatory guy saying, you know, we want to get as many documents as we can into our file in case the PMDA comes and asks questions, we're conservative, if we have more documents, all the much better. You have a good relationship with the Japanese regulatory person from the West, and you, they understand that what you're saying is 300000 cost is real, and you want them to understand that cost and make sure that it's really required. So, again, building that trust with your counterparts in Japan on the regulatory and business uh, area is so important. Our next question is, we would like to send some of our Western uh, business executives to PMDA meetings with our Japanese colleagues. Uh, do you think that's a good or do you think that's a bad thing? So we would like to send um, some of our Western colleagues to the Japanese PMDA meetings. Is that good or bad? Well, in general, I'd say if you have your own people in Japan or you have regulatory people at a distributor or a partner you have in Japan, it's best to let your partner's regulatory people in Japan go to the Japanese PMDA. And I don't think in general sending Western Western counterparts to go to the PMDA it's really going to help your cause because normally the, Japan, the PMDA really appreciates dealing with other Japanese people they don't have a translation problem etc um, especially if a western person goes to the PMDA and starts demanding things like this product is approved in all the countries in the world Japan is the only one that won't approve it what is your problem obviously that's not going to help when a western executive and acts like that in uh, uh, the PMDA office but in general I'd say to the extent that your Japanese people are competent let them do the regulatory work in Japan, or let the distributors, regulatory people handle the situation. I wouldn't send foreigners or Westerners to go uh, to PMDA meetings unless it's really crucial. And of course, when those Western people go to the PMDA, remember those PMDA officials are the top of the crop, Japanese people, well-educated, very knowledgeable, and treat them with the utmost respect. Um, Okay, we have another question. Again, if people want to ask questions, please send them in now. So, um, let's see. So, this question is, we're dealing, we're trying to find a partner in Japan. We've received a proposal from one Japanese company uh, one month after we met with them. The, uh, the other three Japanese companies we met with, we haven't received proposals from them, and we want to make a deal, but we're concerned if we make a deal with the first company, the, the other companies. The other three companies' proposals may be better, but you know they're going to be delayed, so what should we do? We want to have all the proposals come across the finish line at the same time so we can evaluate them simultaneously. Well, obviously, in the West, you want to get all those proposals simultaneously so you can evaluate which one is best and start with that company with regard to negotiations. But again, you may find a Japanese company that's more westernized that moves quicker than three other traditional Japanese companies that are going through this ringi approval system internally, it takes a long time to get things done. So I guess my only advice to that person would be to be patient and just wait for the other three proposals to come in. Uh, it'd be better just to be patient instead of, instead of um, pushing these other three uh, Japanese companies with their proposals to come in right away by saying, look, we received one proposal. If we don't get your, three right away, your, your proposal right away, we're going to not consider your situation. That would be the wrong way to approach it. The best way would be would be we received, as you know, we talked to several partners in Japan. We received one proposal last week. We would like to compare your proposal to the other companies, so we would appreciate you sending your proposal in as soon as possible. We don't mean to be too pushy or arrogant, but we would like to compare the proposal side by side. The better way to say it then, we got one proposal, we haven't gotten yours, are you really interested? So I don't think we have any more questions. If there are any questions, uh, please send them in now. Uh, otherwise, I'd like you to see our last slide here, which says we're having a Chinese medical device regulatory update uh, on March 7th. You can go to our website and sign up for this medical device regulations update uh, and uh, uh, on Chinese regulations. And again, uh, we appreciate your attendance. We uh, look forward to seeing you in another webcast, and we will appreciate your feedback on the evaluation. So, again, my name is Ames Gross. Thanks for listening. Hope it was helpful, and uh, have a nice day. So the webcast is now over, and thank you very much.